Kia ora te whanau, tēnā koutou e, um, e ako hoi mahi, tēnā koutou. Ko Karen Kelly taku ingoa, ke te whare wānanga o Tamaki Makaurau. Ko Macron Chaplin, Chapel, te whare karakia. Nā mehi nui ki a katou katoa. He honoe, he kororia ki te atua. Kia ora. Greetings, friends. And welcome to this University of Auckland and to McLaurin Chapel, this house of prayer, house of gathering, a house of learning. I'm Carolyn Kelly, chaplain of the university and a longtime friend and colleague of Nicholas, Andrews and of many of you in the audience. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to this launch of Christians in Science, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Others to follow will speak more about this exciting initiative what it means, what it might do, who it might involve, inspire, empower and engage. And it is my privilege to represent the University Chaplaincy as support and joint host, pleased to be a base for this gathering in Auckland and for the rest of the country, for the work of Christians in Science, or CIS. This is, I believe, a partnership of friendship and of thoughtfulness, of creative creativity and insight. It is the fruit of sowing the small seeds of ideas and dreams, watered with hard work and incarnational presence, trusting in God's agency and the Spirit's insight, and using the best of the minds and abilities God has given us. And I might go further as a theologian, not of science, but with a particular interest in the arts, to suggest this is also a venture of poesis, which is the Greek word for making, and from which we get our English word poem. For surely the earth and the heavens and all that dwell within them are a poem of wonder and complexity. Or as the ancient psalmist affirmed in theological language, they tell of God's handiwork. And another affirmation a theologian might make, if you'll permit me, is that as human beings, our race has a great capacity for brilliance and for beauty. For surely we are endowed with a create, creative capacity to make. And the romantic poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge once suggested that no truly great advance in the field of science or mathematics in the sciences, in other words, could be made without imagination. And it is that imagination, as we know, which can be in creative conflict with the world of matter and of energy for good and for destructive ends. So that is one reason, amongst many, why it is good to support and foster conversations about human imagination, about human creativity and productivity, and about science in a university, to involve, to inspire, to empower, and to engage. So welcome, Christians in Science. Here's to a great partnership and a great future. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā kato, kato. Welcome again, everybody. We're really glad that you're all here um, to this launch of New Zealand Christians in Science in Auckland. I'm Nicola Hoggard Cregan, and Graham Finlay, who's where, and I are the co directors of this new enterprise. And Graham will speak to you in just a few minutes. Um, welcome, first of all, to Jake, who's in Singapore, watching all of this through um, live stream over there. And I'll tell you a bit more about Jake in a minute. Um, and a very big welcome to Bethany Saladera, who is here from England and from, he's representing the Templeton World Charity Organization that has given us the grant. Um, but more about them soon. And we would, I would also like to welcome our advisory board, those that are here tonight, um, Professor Neil Broom, who is, um, where, where's Neil Broom? Thank you, Neil. And um, Professor Jeff Tallon, who's going to speak to us tonight. And Professor Andrew Schelling, thank you very much for being here as well. Um, so, yeah, 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 just 
Um, I just want to give you a brief history of our very young institution. This is the website, and so I would encourage you all to go to the website. On the website, you will find blogs, you will find um, the access to Facebook as well, and you'll be able to join us. And if you join us, we'll be able to contact you more easily. Next one. So yes, just please join us. Next one. Um, I wanted to go over our Maori name to start with. We have a new Maori name, and so I wanted to explain what it is. This was um, arrived at after much consultation. So Te Kahui Whakapono are the, something like the elect believers. Kina Kaiputaya, who investigate the universe, and Otomoto on the island. Actually, I think it's a very nice name. So that's our Maori name for New Zealand Christians in science. Next slide. Um, the people involved are um, Jake Martin, who was the one who actually um, did the um, application for the grant in cooperation with Graham Finlay, Zach Arden, who was also helping him, and then I'm the one who's actually doing the work at the moment, and then Phil Church, who's also down the back, is doing all the accounts. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you get the, um, the advisory board, and as well as Jeff Tallon and Neil Broom and Andrew Schelling, there's Peter Monroe, Philip Patamore, George Sieber, who gives us apologies for tonight, Grant Gillette, Gareth Jones, Helen Nicholson from Otago, and Carolyn King from Waikato. Um, next one. Um, so, the grant that we have is from the Templeton World Charity Foundation, Incorporated, and we are very grateful for that, and grateful to Bethany, who helped us so much in the preparation of the grant. Um, it's based on a model of the UK Christians in Science, um, so we have something to follow. Um, Jake Martin, as I said, and Dr. Graham Finley were the ones who actually did the work. Jake Martin is a chemistry PhD student who's, who, as soon as he applied for the grant, disappeared off to Cambridge, although he's really in Singapore because Cambridge has an outpost in Singapore. And so that's where he's watching from today. <laughs> um, and then, as you know, um, I was running TANSA for seven years, which is Theology and the Natural Sciences in Aotearoa. And so what we've done is we've sort of combined them. But theologians still join TANSA and, and scientific people still join NZCIS um, because the grant is specifically for people who are scientists or science students. But we want to encourage dialogue between the two groups of people. Um, next slide. Yes. In Auckland, we are very grateful to have a memorandum of agreement with McLaurin Chapel and with Carolyn, who has very generously hosted us here, which makes all the difference in the world, as you can imagine, being on a university campus and having access um, in this way. So we are incredibly grateful to Carolyn for, for, this, for this partnership, which is um, very new and which is working so well. What we hope to do in Auckland, and in fact in other parts of the, of the country, because we are not just going to be in Auckland, but in other parts of New Zealand as well, is to run discussion groups, um, seminars, and we're going to have one conference in Auckland this year. We're going to have blogs on, um, on the website, and you know, that that's also should be a point at which you um, interact with us so that you know what's going on. Next one. We are very pleased to announce that in September we will be having a, a major conference. There will be one conference in the next three years in Auckland and one in 2019 in Dunedin or in Christchurch, one or the other. But in, on September 22nd and 23rd we are going to have Professor Christopher Southgate um, who will speak to us on something to do with glory and the problem of evil. We haven't exactly worked that out yet. Um, but he is the author of The Groaning of Creation He's a theologian who's also worked, who's a biochemist, who's also worked in the origins of life. And he's also um, published six volumes of poetry, so he'll fit in very well in this, in this, in this chapter. So please put those dates onto your, um, into your calendars. Next. Um, so why belong? It's going to be much easier for us to contact you if you belong. Um, it'll give you access to resources and to events streamed around the country. Um, it'll give you the sense of belonging to something bigger. It'll help you to participate in conferences. And there will be student scholarships. So if you're a student, please belong. It's free if you're a student. Okay, next one. Um, 
the areas of importance, I mean, sometimes people tell me that there's really, they have no, no um, problems with the science and theology interface, so why do we need a whole organization? And um, other people sort of say, well, you know, there's so much conflict that there's really nothing to discuss, or that they're just completely different disciplines. But these are some of the areas that I think are of interest. Um, how do we understand human nature and human uniqueness? I think those are some of the most fascinating questions on the planet. How did religion emerge and what is its relevance? How do we relate to other life forms? You know, we have come to dominate the, the planet. How do we understand that? How do we limit that? And also, how do we understand other creatures? The problem of evil and the presence of God and creation, which um, Christopher has written on, I have written on, and also Bethany has written on, I think is an ongoing and urgent problem. And then there's also robotics and AI and the changing technological profile of everyday life. All of these are issues that I think are some of the most fascinating that are around, and we in invite you to join us in talking about these. In terms of scripture, I think one of the key passages is Colossians 1, 16 and 17. In Christ, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. Christ is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And I think that this is a text which allows us to be quite confident that this work on the intersection of the visible and the invisible is of great importance. Okay, the people who are going to speak tonight. Uh, first of all, Dr. Graham Finlay, who's a senior lecturer in scientific pathology in the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences and is also a director of this organization. Um, Tempany World Charity representative, Dr. Bethany Solidera, over here. Um, advisory board member Jeff Tallon, um, and then Andrew Saunders, where is Andrew? Um, over there, who was vice principal at Selwyn, has just resigned, and is a science teacher, and Andrew has um, donated his time to help science, uh, Christians in science um, get going, and he will in particular be running discussion groups. So if you're interested in joining a discussion group, faculty and students, please contact Andrew. And then just to show that really we are a theology and science organization, Dr. Nick Thompson from the Department of Theology, is it still theology, um, at Auckland will also address us. Um, and then student, um, Emma Belker, where's Emma? Oh, who has just finished a master's degree in, um, in philosophy, but has previously done anthropology, and she also was looking at the problem of evil in evolutionary history. Um, thanks to those who have already been mentioned for the um, incredible amount of work which they have done in bringing this to pass. So thank you especially to uh, Jake and Zachary, to Nicola, it's so wonderful with her background in uh, thinking and research and teaching at the interface of science and Christian theology. Um, and also it's wonderful to have such an erudite um, Advise, set of advisors around us. So I just thought maybe in a very few minutes just to think of the importance of the interface between science and Christian theology. I don't know whether any of you will remember reading an article by Professor Emeritus Bob Nola um, last Boxing Day. And he was, he was a philosopher here um, not a Christian, an atheist, but one who has worked with Christians against some of the fads, the intellectual fads which have come around. And Bob Nola started writing this column in the Herald. It's no lie. The Oxford University's international word for 2016 is post-truth. Sorry, did somebody say that? Post-truth. That is the new in word. And I think this has got a lot to say to scientists and theologians. And in particular, Bob Nola expressed his concern about the new, um, well, it's not so new, the lack of confidence in truth. And he followed it back to streams in his um, in, in, um, philosophy and in humanities, um, people like Richard Rorty and even um, Friedrich Nietzsche who declared that truth was really what you could get away with. 
and uh, really it was just some sort of um, agreement you come to. And Bob no and Professor Nola finished his little piece by saying, we need to come to that one place where truth is still guarded and guaranteed as part of the work. And this is science. And he left his comment at that. And to me, reading it, I mean, he's a brilliant man, and it was a very good article as far as it went. But what guarantees the truth in science? Does not science itself depend on some presuppositions, some worldview um, upon which it's sustained and from which it arises? Uh, Professor Nola may not have read an article about, in Nature about two months before where there had been a big problem at a very prestigious university, the, the Karolinska Institute, and the writer was a Swedish um, uh, philosopher of science, if you like, and he was be, be, berating the development of... Um, now, sorry, the, the terms just left me for a minute. Sorry, I've had eight hours, five hours of teaching today. Um, <laughs> academic capitalism. Berating the idea that universities were increasingly seeing their work, including science, as a means to increased prestige and scientific discoveries, if you like, as a means to increased monetary input. In other words, what about an environment that is materialistic? A materialistic in metaphysic, which will then flow into an environment which is materialistic in its practical operations. Will science maintain its integrity and its search for truth in that sort of environment? And I suggest that it won't. I mean, he was using a big botch at the Karolinska Institute as an example of how the quest for intellectual property um, perhaps sidelines the quest for truth. And so as a Christian, this resonates deeply with me because I believe that science acquires its integrity because it arose deeply in, Christ in, in European history, largely in European history, as an out as a outcome of Christian theology. I'd just like to mention two wonderful books I've recent, recently read, and Bethany comes from the lab of the author of one of them, a book called um, The Penultimate Curiosity. And in this multidisciplinary audience, it's a wonderfully multidisciplinary book because one author is one of England's top artists, religious artists, and the other author is a quantum physicist um, and an FRS, Fellow of the Royal Society, Professor Andrew Briggs. And they argue that science has arisen almost in the slipstream of the ultimate curiosity, which is religious questions about what's this universe here for? Why the order? Is there a mind behind it? And from that ultimate curiosity comes the penultimate curiosity, which is science. How do these physical things around us work? And Wagner and Briggs... Um, right, it's been cogently argued that through history, science has been carried forward in the slipstream of a prior metaphysical curiosity rooted in the human need to make sense of the world as a whole. Do We don't really need, I think, to justify inquiry at the science-Christian theology interface. Underlying science has been the idea of a single, beneficent, rational agency which could not be identified with anything within the universe but gave to the whole a law-like character. And that agency we would identify as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. One final comment before I sit down. And this comes from another book which I've just read. This is a, a book uh, written by a physics teacher at school and another physics professor, uh, Tom McLeish, who's a wonderful man. And it's called Let There Be Science. 
And they also emphasize the compatibilities between the Christian background to looking at reality and the science which has risen from it. And they write, the practice of science flows naturally from the Christian view of reality. The Christian outlook on the world is the bedrock for doing science. Look, I look forward to some wonderfully fruitful and open discussions on this relationship carried forward. And I hope we can include students from high school upwards to the top professors. I can remember once in this very building um, meeting a pathetically small group of students who'd come to hear Professor Robert Boyd, FRS, Professor of Physics at London University, Director of the Mullard Space Research Centre. And I stood around and asked him one very naive question. And he gave me a very simple answer. And we just stood there. I was desperately thinking of questions, and he was probably desperately waiting for questions. And nothing came. But just that experience of a wonderful man of God who was such an amazing scientist, I'm sure has been with me ever since. And I'm sure with people like our esteemed professors and others who are coming forward, that Christians in science may have that ability to break through some of the post-truth garbage of our society and illuminate people and strengthen them on their journey. Thank you. Bethany. Thank you. Well, Nicola asked me to talk about why I was so enthusiastic about developing this project in Christians in Science. And so to do that, I need to take you back about a decade um, when I was little, uh, littler, slightly, you know, in various ways, littler. Anyways, come back with me to, uh, I was in the last year of my undergraduate. I went to a small Bible college in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And it's actually such an exclusive place that nobody in Edmonton even realizes it exists. So as I was coming to the end of, of my time, I was looking towards what to do next. And I had enrolled at a place called Regent College in Vancouver and was happily enrolled in the history program, not doing anyone any harm. And then my dad came home one day, and he's a medical doctor, and he had with him a business card from a professor at the University of Alberta. And I remember looking at this, it said, Dennis Lamoureux, PhD, PhD, DDS. Three doctorates. I can't talk to this guy. I don't even have my undergraduate degree. But he had attended Regent, so he said, why don't you come out and, and meet with me? We can talk about this. So I went, and I was terrified. I was sitting there trying to wipe the sweat off my palms before I shook hands so that he wouldn't realize how nervous I was meeting this guy who had a dentistry degree, then a PhD in theology and a PhD in evolutionary biology. And so we had a great chat about Regent. And then he said, you know, I've got this book that I'm just about to put out. I wonder if you would read it for me and give me feedback. And I thought, you want my feedback? I said, what's it on? And he said, well, it's called evolutionary creation. I'm going, does that, does that involve science? Because I don't, I don't really do science. I'm, I'm not a scientist. He goes, oh, it'll be, it'll be fine. And so I read this book, and what captured me was how bringing science to the table affected questions of hermeneutics, affected questions of how do we read the Bible. So in Canada, uh, primarily amongst evangelicals, the majority of people would still accept a young earth. They wouldn't accept that evolution happened, and that becomes an identity marker of belief. If you're Christian, you reject science. And um, suddenly, bringing these questions of science to the table started challenging some of the ideas that I had about how the Bible is true, or why we believe it, or what faith is built on. And so I ended up leaving my history program and enrolling in interdisciplinary studies and looking at questions of science and belief, not because I was a scientist, but because I found that bringing science discussions to the table brought a really dynamic sense of depth and richness to theological inquiry. Um, 
And one of the questions that kept coming up when I talked to people was the question of, of suffering that Nicola brought up. People were wondering about, OK, if God created through evolution, doesn't that mean that God used suffering and death and violence and competition as tools of creation? Uh, and so I thought, I thought this was a really good question. And so that's what I did for my undergraduate and, and my PhD. And well, or not my undergraduate, my master's. And while I was in Vancouver, I got involved with what's called the uh, Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation, which is kind of like New Zealand CIS except Canadian. And it was a brilliant thing to join because it allowed me to meet with tons of other people who were interested in the same questions. It allowed me to find people who could mentor me in those early stages of, of academic development took me to the, to the uh, general annual meeting of the American Scientific Affiliation, where I again stood around being really intimidated by NASA astronauts and huge scientists who worked at CERN. And I did a lot of uh, trying to wipe the sweat off my palms again, um, but really found just this lovely community of people who were encouraging, uh, who were engaging with the same questions I was asking. And it, and it really became a, a place of formation for me. So when the chance came to see New Zealand CIS built, I just thought, yeah, I've seen what great things this sort of model can do and really wanted to be behind it. So um, I really hope that this becomes a dynamic place where students and professors can interact on these ultimate questions um, of, of meaning, of purpose, but also of why we do what we do, whether scientists or theologians, looking at questions that are pressing, climate change, ecological questions, uh, questions coming out of genetic engineering and sustainability. There are so many places where faith and, and science can engage in really fruitful ways. So thank you all for coming. And I, I know that you here will make this project a success. And I look forward to reading the articles and the books that come out of your fruitful discussion. Thank you. OK, so um, I want to get across the idea that we actually have a huge challenge ahead of us. There's real work to be done uh, out there. And I believe that Christians in science can uh, contribute to this task in a very significant way. Now. Um, just to illustrate a point, first of all, this, of course, we know is um, a representation of DNA. This is the ribosome that translates the um, <coughs> messenger RNA, which is copied off the DNA. It translates that messenger RNA into proteins. And proteins are what does the stuff in, in our bodies. It does the metabolism. It builds up the various uh, substrates that our bodies are made out of. There's about 100,000 uh, different proteins that are uh, encoded in that DNA. But the DNA sits inside um, <clears throat> the nucleus. This sits outside of the nucleus, but inside the cell. OK, so that messenger RNA has to do a very simple thing. It's got to come from this complex fellow here, and it's read off by a very complex machine. Uh, it's got to get through the nuclear wall to get out to the ribosome in order to be converted into proteins. OK. And the way it does it, it goes through a doorway, which is pretty natural. Uh, here's the doorway, with a bit of luck. Um, <clears throat> it's these nuclear pores, which are sitting here all over. This is uh, that orange is, is part of the nuclear sac that the nucleus sits in. And outside of that is the cell. OK, so the messenger RNA has to come through this doorway. Very simple. OK, and here's a closer picture of the doorway. It comprises seven uh, components here. Um, now, it turns out that doorway is not so simple. The stuff in here is incredibly complex. This is incredibly uh, complex. But that doorway is unbelievably complex because there's lots of other stuff that could go through that doorway and poison the nucleus or um, completely upset the metabolism. So that's got to be a smart door. And there are 1,000 different proteins, 1% of the total output of proteins, of different proteins that the body makes, 
that goes into just constructing that doorway so that only um, <coughs> messenger RNA, which is encoded at the front with the password for getting through the doorway, um, <coughs> it'll do that business. And of course, it's going on trillions of times in your body uh, every second. <coughs> so that's the message that I want to leave with you. In science, wherever you look, whether it's in the cosmos, in cosmology, or in biology, whatever you look at, you see profound complexity. There's a paper in Nature um, not so long ago that suggested we may never ultimately understand uh, biology because of these layers upon layers of complexity. Okay, so I want to start off just by uh, sort of reiterating something that uh, Graham has said. Christianity is, in essence, the pursuit of knowledge of the Creator through Jesus Christ. Science is, in essence, pursuit of knowledge of creation. So as a consequence, there cannot be conflict uh, between the two, and indeed they must fuse together into a single understanding of the universe, and actually beyond the universe. So science and Christian faith must not only coexist. It was suggested that science and faith can coexist because they simply don't overlap. You probably heard of the non-overlapping magisteria uh, picture. But I put it to you that they have to interface completely. Not only coexist, they must be conjoined. Conjoined. They are each integral to the other. And I think that scientists actually are in the privileged position of best being able to see that unity and best being able to appreciate the spectacular and highly improbable character of the created universe, whether at the cosmic scale or at the scale of the subtleties of molecular biology. <clears throat> now, of course, that doesn't mean there aren't challenges. The prevailing methodologies and outlook of the academic uh, community as we experience day by day are essentially atheistic and the general public climate is one of pluralism and relativism. Religion, Christianity in particular, is regarded as at best purely cultural and at worst a persistent but foolish relic of an archaic superstition. Faith is, by assumption, blind faith. So this is precisely where the scientist who is a Christian has a crucial vocation. For he or she lives by evidence and rational discourse. And the challenge is very clear because our young people, our young families, our middle-aged, every category across the spectrum are drifting away from practicing Christianity. Now, more than at any time since the first century, the church has an epic challenge to turn this around. And Christians in science have a lead role to play in this. It is we who can affirm the evidences of the Bible, the evidences of natural theology, and the evidences of Jesus. We live in a created universe, and its createdness will be one of the many observable characters of the universe. Indeed, it will be the overarching fact of the universe, and the universe will bear, and indeed does bear, the stamp and signature of that createdness. This overriding question of createdness runs deeper than political, moral, social, or even religious formulae. It implies a fundamental imperative for every individual that transcends culture, society, or religion. For if createdness is the very nature of the universe, then cultural and religious disposition have absolutely no bearing on this underlying reality. If the universe is created, then it is purposeful, and the epic vocation of every individual is to discover and know the creator and orient his life humbly and resolutely to the nature and purposes of God. Such purposes are grounded in rational thinking, sacrificial love, and devotion to justice. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, 
and with all your strength. And this remains the enduring imperative for all mankind and shall ever be so. And we, in CIS, have the task of affirming this to each other, to students, to our colleagues, to our churches, and to the public at large. There's work to be done. Look, I've had the privilege of teaching biology to uh, 16 and 8 to 18 year olds for 20 years and, and teaching uh, theology to the same group of students plus university students for some 15 years as well. So what I want to do today is just um, give you a little bit of a glimpse at what it's like at the coalface, I guess you would say, you know, amongst our high schools. I currently have 100 biology students aged from 16 to 18 that I teach a couple of periods a week. And uh, of course, um, we're hoping to actually garner something amongst you students here and lecturers at, at university, both Auckland and the, and the Grafton campus. Now, I was a student once, and I remember when I was uh, 16 years old, the uh, biology teacher asked us to write an essay about evolution and the evidence for it. And I can remember beginning my essay by saying, although I believe otherwise and will not change my mind, this is the evidence for evolution. I went on to write six or seven pages about stuff that I'd gleaned, and I finished with the remark, uh, while there does appear to be some evidence, I am resolute in my own opinion, <laughs> or something along those lines. I went on to be a, a master's student at, at this university, Auckland University, and ended up studying evolutionary biology, amongst other things, and, and during that time remained quite sceptical. And so when I started teaching, I asked the principal, uh, John Graham he was, because I was at Auckland Grammar at the time, whether it would be okay for the seventh form and, and sixth form students, as we called them in those days, whether I could teach a little bit of creation alongside evolution and the biology syllabus, to which he agreed. But I remember uh, after uh, presenting um, uh, some of uh, what I took to be the scriptural interpretation, a, a confident young man stood up in the middle of the class and said, Sir! Do not insult our intelligence with this drivel about creation. So it was an extraordinarily um, uh, introduction. And uh, I guess really, you know, to be honest, after uh, 25, 30 years on, uh, my joy now is, is asking students questions and trying to get them to think. Because what I've discovered is that uh, the questions you ask, the methodology you use, uh, what you look for largely determines the answers you come from. And I can remember as a uh, final year uh, master's student at Auckland University being shown two papers side by side in the Journal of uh, Neurology. Now Grant Gillette's not here today, I don't I think he wrote one because he wasn't that much older than me, but at, um, these two papers were describing a neurological pathway in the brain. They had a completely different view on what that pathway was. But when you unpack the papers, you recognise they had completely different methodology. So what I'm trying to do with students is, is get them to ask questions, get them to dialogue, get them to talk. Now everyone knows that, um, that many of the early scientists had a Christian faith and Sir Isaac Newton wrote more words about theology than he did about um, gravity. I mean, there's not much to say about gravity, is it? Really, he just described it in a formula, but anyway. Um, but some of, one of my favourite scientists was Faraday, who many of you know has um, sort of mapped uh, 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 the, the magnetic field around wires and also you know, looked at the magnetic fields around the Earth. And what I loved about him, with a paper I read, um, was that he talked about the Christian community and the home group he was involved of and how have I helped him and he helps her and she helps him and he helps him. Eventually it's going to come back to help me again. So the circle of... Um, movement of forces seemed to be the perfect way in which to describe magnetic fields. And as we know, it was quite useful because it led to the development of the electric motor and other things like that. Look, I want to just briefly touch on four people in history that I often raise uh, with students uh, uh, for various reasons when you're teaching science and biology. The first is Nicholas Copernicus. And as you are probably aware, uh, Nicholas Copernicus uh, started a revolution. I don't think he wanted to. I think in most of his work he'd rather have been hidden at the time. But anyway, he identified, of course, the fact that the sun rather than the earth was the centre of the universe. But the Roman Catholic Church did not come kindly to this. And as you know, he was 
condemned as a heretic. Uh, as, after all, it says in Ecclesiastes 1.5, the sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. Uh, now, we've come to understand nowadays that the sun is the centre of our solar system, but it shouldn't escape our attention that back then, Christians did not believe that it was. In fact, the whole of the church institution was against it. I think C.S. Lewis was somewhat tongue-in-cheek when he said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Bit of a play on Copernicus, perhaps? I don't know about that. Anyway, the second man is Charles Darwin. Now, one of the things I was introduced to as a student at university, and I love telling my students about, is grandchildren are like grandfathers. One of the things Darwin used to talk about. And, of course, he talked about the means of descent, uh, uh, means of descent by modification and with natural selection being the driving force. Uh, and I love telling kids this because, of course, uh, the driving force nowadays for new uh, genes is not natural selection. In fact, in many ways, it's the thing that limits the scope and width of genes that we have by knocking out that those that are unfit. So it's helpful for students to know that while Darwin came up with this theory, the mechanism he postulated was perhaps not right. But, you know, the thing is about Darwin that, um, that interests me most is his great trouble with the Fijian barbarians, as he called them in terms of, he writes about them in his novel, Descent of Man. And he was really shaken in his voyage on the, fugle, on the Beagle by what happened to the Fugians. And the fact that while some of them had been taken over to England and converted and then transformed, they quickly reverted back to type in the islands. But what not many people know is that 30 or 40 years later, one of Darwin's great friends was still involved in mission and Darwin was still supporting him and giving money for that mission. The other thing about Darwin that I do talk to students about too is that he was deeply troubled by the problem of pain. And if you read his biographies, you're aware that uh, just how deeply the death of his beloved daughter, Annie, cut across his understanding of a God who could love. Um, so um, anyway, as um, one that I love quoting this fellow here because he um, is... You know, next, next to Lewis, really, his name is Theodosiev Dovzansky. Many of you know him as a great Russian evolutionary biologist, but he was also an orthodox priest of some sort. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So, students, you have to grapple with uh, what the, the evidence for evolution is and the mechanism of it is post-Darwin and what we've discovered. The third couple of people I want to just mention briefly are Watson and Crick. I had the privilege um, of going over to uh, Cambridge a couple of years ago with my family to meet up with uh, a niece of mine who's studying not science but um, history, I think it is, Helen, isn't it, at um, Cambridge University. But we went to the Eagle to have a pint and you know, have lunch. And those of you who know the Eagle, and I'm sure many here do, will know it as the place which our own Ernst Rutherford used to go to, to have his lunch. It's not far from the um, Cavendish Laboratory where he split the atom. And it's actually a pub very famous also for the British airmen, whose names in the World War II, whose names are written all over the ceiling and pictures adorn there as eagle, rise up with, like wings like eagle. I guess they like the name in terms of their battle against Hitler. But it's also the place where one lunchtime, a couple of young scientists, Watson and Crick, uh, announced uh, to their friends quite excitedly that they'd discovered a structure for what we just saw up on the board, deoxyribose nucleic acid. And I give my students the paper, 16-year-olds. They can't cope with it, but I'm really interested in just two sentences. We wish to suggest a structure for deoxyribose nucleic acid, which is the first sentence they begin with. And then they conclude with, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. One chart paper that changed our view of life. But it's not those two sentences that I enjoy the most. 
It's this one. We were not aware of the details of the results presented, and they're referring, of course, to Rosalind Franklin's x-ray that was done by her male student, when we devised our structure of DNA. What a load of balderdash. I think these guys were very well aware. The fact that Rosalind Franklin wasn't invited along to the Eagle is something that the female students I teach enjoy a great deal. Worthwhile us thinking about a little bit. Round their table fellowship, men only, they snared the young student who took the x-ray that presented them with the very picture of what the double helix actually looked like. So this is something else that students quite, find quite interesting. But of course, I think the thing that we have to grapple with today, and I was just talking to my students today about this, is that these days, uh, as Franz de Waals, who is this um, great evolutionary, um, or the guy that looks at monkeys anyway, it reminds us, chimps have 96% of the DNA that humans have. Now what do we make of that? 100 biology students are interested in that information. And so we need to read, we need to think, we need to, to, to um, make connections with the facts that we know in the life that we live in. Hi, um, my name's Nick Thompson and I'm here representing the uh, unfortunately named discipline of theological and religious studies. We have this rather complex new terminology uh, for our uh, various organisational units in the, in the university. So I represent theological and religious studies in the School of Humanities in the Faculty of Arts. Nicola asked me along tonight to, uh, to lend, my, uh, lend the theological and religious studies uh, support to this group, which um, I'm very happy to do. Uh, as I was walking down the uh, hill from the train station today, I was um, thinking about uh, C.P. Snow's famous 1959 lectures in which he spoke about um, humanities and the sciences in terms of two cultures or tribes uh, that had a very poor understanding of each other, to the extent that they weren't even really able to talk to each other. People in the humanities knew only humanities, people in the sciences knew only sciences. And, and C.P. Snow called on these two cultures uh, to start speaking to each other. And as I was thinking about that, it seemed to me that uh, there was a clear need uh, for a similar enterprise in relation to sciences and uh, Christianity. Uh, evidence of that um, is before my eyes every day. Every time I fire up Facebook, they speak about um, Facebook isolating us in a bubble, um, but that's far from my experience. Um, and almost every day I see uh, Facebook friends and acquaintances from both sides of this um, gulf of comprehension uh, speaking about the relationship between sciences and Christianity in a way that uh, demonstrates a very poor understanding of one or the other or both. Um, but I'd also like to put in a plug for two other constituencies that I represent. Uh, one, the first of those is humanities. As I say, our newly minted discipline exists within a school of humanities and also, of course, on behalf of the theologians. Now, in a sense, um, Nicola and Carolyn have already done a very good job of that, but I'd also just like to add my own two cents worth on behalf of the theologians. Firstly, in relation to uh, the humanities, um, I think it was um, Jeff um, spoke briefly before about the way in which uh, the churches were uh, losing uh, young people in New Zealand, and that's very clearly the case. They are. There's plenty of um, sociological data to, to support that. Um, but I think it would be wrong to imagine uh, that the tension between science and uh, the Christian faith um, is solely responsible for that. Uh, I think you also have to be looking for the reasons for that in, in, a, in a whole number of areas, but one of them 
would be in the discipline of humanities. Rodney Stark, um, the American sociologist, famously, um, this is a rather old study now, and I'm not sure um, whether his findings would be replicated now, uh, but he famously surveyed uh, American academic faculty and found much higher levels of irreligion among uh, academics in the social sciences and humanities than he did in the hard sciences. And um, one of the things that I've experienced as um, a, a theologian of a kind in, in, in the Faculty of Arts is that um, the intellectual, the prevalent intellectual trends, particularly in New Zealand, unfortunately, uh, that um, Graham spoke about at the beginning, um, that this uh, the, the, the scepticism about the pursuit of truth, um, this kind of epistemological scepticism, uh, is hostile to, both toward theology and toward the sciences. And it seems to me that if you're not bringing uh, current intellectual trends in the humanities um, into this, this conversation, even if it's just to sort of uh, to and fro debate with them, um, then in a sense you, you, this kind of dialogue will be missing part of the point. Um, so that, that's where I think the humanities is, is uh, or could be uh, a, both a beneficial uh, but also a important uh, dialogue partner in, this, in, in the broader conversation that you're initiating here. Um, secondly, I said I'd speak um, briefly on behalf of the, the theologians. Now, um, although I have a theology degree, I am not a proper theologian. I am a historian of theology, and um, anything that happened after 1700 terrifies me. Um, but even so, let, let, let me offer a, a few examples simply from that perspective as a historian of theology um, that might... Um, uh, bring something to, to, to this discussion. Um, so what, what, one of the things that um, I, I stress with the students uh, that I'm teaching about the history of Christianity, and I think one of the things they find deeply uncomfortable, is that Christianity is an incredibly complex and diverse tradition across its full history. Uh, so, for, a, a, as an example of that, um, we were speaking before about the relationship between um, the, the, the sciences, the natural sciences, and natural theology. And that's an important discussion. Um, but I would also like to add, uh, as a historian of the Reformation, that there's a long-standing trend within the Christian tradition, both the Protestant tradition and the Catholic tradition, that's profoundly hostile to uh, the enterprise of natural theology. Uh, ex among examples of that, I'd include Luther, whose 500th anniversary we're, we're celebrating this year. Um, but uh, the relationship between uh, natural theology and revealed theology is also complicated by... Um, quite devout Catholic thinkers and scientists in the 17th century, um, like René Descartes and Blaise uh, Pascal, who really begin to set the two enterprises at, at quite a distance, from which, in, in my view, and, and, and remember that I don't know much about what happened, what happened after the 17th century, um, but, but set a distance between the two enterprises in a way that I'm not convinced they've ever quite uh, recovered from. So, so, so when we're talking about the relationship between Christianity and the sciences, um, my answer is what tradition within Christianity, what way of doing theology are we talking about uh, when we're having that uh, conversation? Another example would be in... in um, relation to the history of hermeneutics, the interpretation of the Bible. Uh, there has always been uh, 
more than one way of interpreting the Bible. Uh, now, I'm, as a historian, I'm not particularly interested in which of those ways are more useful and productive in terms of this conversation we're having uh, and which are less useful. Uh, but it's still important to say, for example, in relation to the interpretation of Genesis, uh, which seems to, 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 to still be a, 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 in some quarters a, a troublesome issue, uh, that there's more than one way of skinning a cat with relation to those first three chapters. Uh, the last observation I'd like to, to offer is that the, in, in historical terms, the hostility between science and religion um, is often uh, greatly overblown. And as an example of that, I would like to uh, just say that Copernicus was never excommunicated by the church. Copernicus was an entirely conventional canon prebend of his cathedral and uh, died a Catholic in good standing. And that was not simply because his works were unknown to uh, the authorities. They were fairly widely, lo widely no lo known. Sorry, uh, Luther thought they were nonsense, but um, they were circulated uh, at the highest levels in Rome and read with uh, great interest by cardinals of the Roman Church who were prepared to opine in some quarters uh, that this view of the universe made better sense, not in scientific terms, but in theological terms, because these cardinals were Neoplatonists um, who saw the whole of creation as, in a sense, uh, drawing us out of the uh, material realm into the spiritual realm. Uh, the sun in this Neoplatonist um, theology uh, represented spiritual things much better than the earth. Therefore, it accorded better with their understanding of how God had created the entire universe that um, the revolution of the planets around the sun should, should somehow model the way in which the entire material universe um, revolved around its um, spiritual creator. So as I say, um, when, we, when we're talking about the, re, the dialogue between Christianity and science, um, always bear in mind um, that there are various ways of approaching these uh, issues theologically, just as I imagine there are uh, different ways of approaching them theologically, uh, so scientifically rather, um, but I think that's rather exciting, and I think it will end up producing a much uh, deeper, more complex, and in the end, more rewarding uh, discussion if, if we can open it up that way. Thank you very much. My name is Emma. As Nicholas said, I am married to Charles Boucher. We have a three-year-old little girl and one on the way. Um, I do not recommend writing a thesis while being a full-time parent to a toddler. It was a very um, interesting time, but I have just completed my master's thesis here at the Auckland, at Auckland University under John Bishop in the philosophy department, um, looking at the inherent nature of pain and suffering given our evolutionary history. So that was a really interesting time for me. I actually had, when I first started out, thinking about doing my master's in theodicy, I had no intention of going down a science line. I almost did it for selfish reasons. I actually had a very personal question about pain and suffering. As a child, I suffered a terrible head injury, and then I later I had complications, um, which has left me with chronic pain for the last 13 years. So I started out actually just looking at traditional theodicies and some contemporary ones. But none of them really sat right with me because they didn't take into account the nature and the reality of this world. Um, and it was almost a sobering thought at the very start of a theodicy I was developing was that I didn't have a head injury because a forbidden fruit was eaten or God was trying to develop my soul, but actually because we live in a world where if you find yourself in line of a piece of metal, in the path of a piece of metal going at a very high speed, you will get a broken skull. And it is in this world that God, it is this world that God declares to be good. And it is in this world that God's purposes 
um, are carried out. So that was an amazing, challenging um, and fascinating time. Um, but my relationship with science and faith was never this smooth. I remember being an 18-year-old coming to Auckland University. I was very opinionated. I loved having debates and I thought, right, as a Christian, I should probably kind of get some evidence to the opinions that I hold. So what, I do, what I'll do is I'll do um, a degree in anthropological science so I can learn why evolution is wrong. And I'll also do a philosophy degree so I can learn about the history of ideas and all the erroneous ways that people thought. Um, and as you can imagine, I just was totally unprepared for what was to follow. Um, it was actually a terrible, really difficult time in my life. I just had such kind of this cognitive dissonance and I did not know how both the science and my faith could fit together. Um, but I remember thinking, there's, I cannot let my faith go. There's, just, there's too much good in this, but I don't know. I don't know how to put them together. Um, so I thought, okay, what I'll do is I'll search for truth because by virtue of its nature, when I encounter it, then I will recognize it. Um, and obviously that went well because here I am. Um, but I feel, I feel really excited about Christians and science because it is exactly the thing that I needed when I was doing my undergraduate degrees. Um, and through this whole journey, it's been a really long one, I have no doubt now that the dialogue and the conversations and the research that we all do, I have no doubt that it, would lead, it will lead us to Christ. Um, and I feel really excited and hopeful, especially for the students that may now be in the place that I was early on in my, in my um, undergraduate years. Um, I feel really hopeful that they will encounter the goodness of their creator, that they won't have to go through the despair that I certainly went through through a really long time. So I feel really privileged that I get to speak to you and that I get to be a part of this wonderful organisation. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, um, for all these very different perspectives. Thank you to all the um, speakers. We're not going to have formal questions because we might be here all night. But please do stay and talk to each other, question or interrogate the speakers, and we look forward to conversations in the future. Thank you.